Ladies and gentlemen, both here in the Kiln Room in Wells Maltings and online, a very good evening to you. Um, welcome to Sea Fever. Welcome to Sea Fever 4. Sea Fever 4 is the fourth iteration of North Norfolk's Festival of Poetry and Prose. Uh, it's the very first one that we've done virtually, and I have said hitherto that I very much hope, for obvious reasons, it'll be the last. Uh, in practice, though, um, doing it virtually as well as with a small audience for most of the events and the Maltings has proved a huge success. And it's partly proved a huge success because of the technical support I have on my left from Mike and Patrick uh, that's proved absolutely inv invaluable. They said they've been on a steep learning curve and they have um, gone up that curve with huge confidence, aplomb, and I hope you'll agree, success. This evening, um, this evening, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to introduce Andy Bloomfield. Andy, I have known for more than 10 years, courtesy of someone in the audience, Ian Scott. Um, I met him when I was making a documentary um, about this area and people who come to visit here and some of whom who would come to stay and the responses uh, amongst some of the local people to them, what they felt about them and um, the relationship between incomers and local people. That's an important subject, um, but more important in many respects is Andy's subject, uh, which is not the relationship between people and people, but people and uh, the local environment. Um, and Andy, who's warden of the Holcomb Estate, uh, is something of an expert on this subject, and he's published two books on the, on that, the, on, um, the matter. The first, Andy, was Birds of North Norfolk, correct? Birds of the Holcomb area. And the second? North Norfolk's wildlife. So it's a huge pleasure this evening to introduce you to Andy Bloomfield. Hello everybody, thank you very much for inviting me to a poetry and literary festival, not my usual gig, but um, as you'll soon find out. Um, so my talk is the times were changing as you can see. Um, so this is a part autobiographical look really at um, my, my short life um, in these parts um, and the way um, the changes that overtook me as a growing up in the area and uh, alongside um, the, the many changes that has happened to wildlife in that short time and we'll com I'll compare and contrast that with what happened in the in the in the distant past and also t with an eye on what potentially may happen in the future right here we go then so um for those of you who don't know me, um, I was born on Holcomb Estate. Uh, my father was a shepherd there for 30 years, but my family ha have, has got long um, roots to the, to the area. Um, my grandmother's uh, family um, were, all, were always in the Holcomb area, and my, my, my grandfather's family, they came from the Whiten area. So, I was um, had this deep connection with the area, um, and I was very lucky in, in the respect that when I was um, growing up, I spent all my youth with my father, um, tending his sheep with his dogs, uh, exploring Holcomb Park, um, every nook and cranny of the woods. Uh, you know, I was allowed to go wherever I wanted, um, and this this instilled a deep love of not only the place but of the natural world um the old boy on the horse in the in the corner there he's my great great grandfather and the family you can see in the, the bottom there they that is my grandfather's family big family and they, they lived at new holcomb which is just the south side of holcomb park uh my family were very uh all working class people they worked from the land and uh, as with many people um, in this area of that generation, they were all very religious, um, Methodists, 
My grandfather was a, a Methodist preacher. Um, my mother was a, an organ player in the, in the chapel. And my brother then went on to become a, a, a vicar of the Church of England. I, however, decided that um, I should turn to the dark side. And um, I've got, um, I will, this is, I'm not trying to glorify in any way what I've done, but to, to, to explain to you my love of the area of natural history, I really need to explain to you a little bit about me and what I did. And you, that all comes into uh, play with, with why I'm still here and why I'm, why I'm doing what I'm doing. So when I grew up, um, I became um, deeply passionate about wildlife through, through the time spent with my father. Um, and it was quite apparent from an early age that I, I didn't want to be a shepherd or perhaps work on the farm because I wanted time that I could spend studying wildlife. Um, however, getting into wildlife wasn't a very easy thing to do um, in, the, um, in the early 1980s when I left school. So I, I took an apprenticeship in printing, but this was all very mundane, but that, that did allow me to earn a bit of money and to, to travel to see wildlife. But however, in the, in the meantime, one of my desires as a young lad was to become a professional wrestler, which seems a very strange uh, choice of um, occupation for the future, maybe. But um, like many working class uh, families, youngsters of that generation, the 1970s and 1980s, we were brought up with uh, television wrestling at four o'clock on a Saturday. And I, I wanted to be the next Mick McManus or uh, Rollerball Rocco. So um, for six years, I, I immersed myself and somehow or another, I managed to get into it and, and become a professional, uh, part-time professional alongside um, printing and watching birds. Strange mix of um, characters, admittedly. But um, to make it in the big time, obviously you have to be completely dedicated. You have to move away from here, chase your dreams in, in all parts of the country. And also you had to be a lot fitter and stronger than what I ultimately was. You had to be a lot bigger and be able to take the knocks and the bumps for however much people thought of a showmanship. Now that, but getting slammed to the ground by an 18 stone bloke is not, is not um, the easiest of thing to, to withstand every night. So I gave that up after about six years. Um, but my other passion was rock and roll, I suppose, uh, heavy rock music. So I then decided that um, I still weren't that enamored with being a printer and I still weren't that enamored with finding the, the opportunities to become a work in conservation. So I decided to uh, have a go at singing in a rock and roll band. But um, my choice of rock and roll weren't um, quite the, the conventional type. I liked punk rock and uh, glam rock and anything in between. So I set out in this part of the world to become a a, a showman and wake up the pub to North Norfolk, which we did. I think some people in the audience might have witnessed that. Um, anyway, uh, so traveling abroad was another great passion. Uh, and I was fortunate again to, to travel to several parts of the world to see tigers in India, cranes in Japan and gorillas in Uganda. But the gist of this, all this nonsense and all this wildlife as well is that Wherever I went and whatever I did, I still realized that my home was always Holcomb in North Norfolk. I never had any desire to be anywhere else, no matter what my love of wrestling or rock and roll perhaps could have taken me. My home was here and I didn't want to be anywhere else. And for all these wonderful things like lions and gorillas and cranes on the ice, um, I still am a true believer there is no substitute for the wildlife of the area that we, we all live in today, which is the reason why I, I stayed here and have followed my ultimate dream of, of working in conservation. So uh, going back to my childhood, I was very fortunate to have been able to, to wander the, the, the greenways and the, the woods of, of Holcomb and North Norfolk. And this track here is, is, a, is, is an old sheep drove on the marshes at Holcomb, Bones Drift, that's called. Uh, it's private now, it's part of Holcomb Estate. But my childhood was spent wandering up and down these, this green lane to the beach and back through Holcomb Park. And this is probably where 
I cut my teeth on, on learning what birds were um, once I got away from my father. And what gave me my true, real true love of, of wildlife in this particular area. So Bones Drift was also has got a, a great historical significance in the Holcomb area because it was named after an old gamekeeper, uh, Sam Bone, who, who was one of the chief bird collectors for the Earl of Leicester at the, the turn of the 1900s, which we'll uh, get to in a, in a short while. So uh, as well as um, watching and studying birds, I also became deeply in, uh, um, involved with trying to capture images with very basic cameras to start with. Um, but again, the landscape of the local area, we, we haven't got dramatic mountain ranges or you know, wide open deserts or anything like that, but we have a subtle landscape, a working landscape, uh, where the sky and the light is key. Uh, and um, these are the things that, that uh, again, help to, to create a magic in North Norfolk, which in my eyes is yet to be surpassed. So growing up, um, again, I went to Wells School and within Wells School, I was very fortunate we had a very good um, woodwork teacher who also was a keen bird watcher and he instilled a great love of natural history even more so in many of the pupils at Wells School in my generation and, he, and particularly birds. And um, one of the life changing moments for me uh, as a youngster was going to Titchwell on a, on a Wells Birds uh, School Bird Club trip and seeing marsh areas uh, towards dusk. Uh, although this is a new, a relatively new photograph of mine, it still shows you the sort of the wildness and the beauty of North Norfolk and the, the birds that are within the landscape. So, as I said, it's all very well and good going to see things like tigers in India and the gorillas in, in Uganda. But for me, there's no substitute from the, seeing the scene behind me. I can, I can remember being in the Rift Valley, seeing uh, thousands of flamingos on the, on the lakes there, and thinking to myself, well, that's all very grand, but that still doesn't match the, uh, the fields around Whiten and Burnham, and Burnham when, when they're full of pink-footed geese. So it's a real iconic species for the area. Uh, they, they spend the winter here, they, they come down from Greenland and Iceland. Um, in the 1980s, when I was growing up as a youngster and first interested in birds, there were very few. Um, historically, they, they date back to the 1800s when, when they would, the, uh, the scientists of the day uh, realised that the pink-footed goose was a separate species from the bean goose. And um, we knew that, um, or they knew that, um, there were lots of pink feet that used to spend the, the winter on the, the marshes at Holcomb. And uh, this was all down to the protection by the, the, the Earl of Leicester at the time. He created a sanctuary and, uh, and thus a pattern formed from, from there on in that's been maintained to this day. The only break was in the Second World War and, and thereafter when all the disturbance from the, the anti-aircraft guns along this coast caused them to disappear. And, and from just after the Second World War, right up until the late 70s and early 80s, there were very few pink feet in this area. So, so when I grew up uh, and, and we were, was starting to get interested in birds, the pink feet were just starting to come back. And um, so really, I, I watched this species return and from probably two or three hundred in a winter, I saw up to 90,000 in the early 2000s. And the appeal of the area was always the sugar beet harvest. What's left from the, the crop uh, when, when they, 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 there's a mechanical um, method used to remove the sugar beet from the ground and the, and the tops and the leaves are cut off the main root. And the, the waste of the harvest is what these pink feet move in to eat. Um, as I say, uh, that's a, one of our true iconic spectacles and species that we still have to this day frequent in the area. So um, alongside the geese and all the fields, another thing that captivated me was, was um, the woodcock as a bird that uh, was hunted um, in Holcomb Park. It's a legal quarry species. 
Um, but it's quite an elusive bird to see. Um, they, they come across from Scandinavia and Eastern Europe to spend the winter here and they, they hide up in the depths of the wood. And if you flush one when you're walking through the woods, the usual view, or if there's a hard winter, such as when this one was taken, they, they emerge to feed in any ice free or if, if the snow has got some thaw in it, they peck in the ground to get worms. So this, this was a species that captivated me as well because they, were, they had a, a deep rooted tradition with holking through the shooting. But I followed a path where I didn't want to shoot these things, I'd, I'd rather watch them and photograph them. And the same for the hares. There's nothing, nothing more captivating in the Norfolk countryside than, than watching hares boxing in the spring. But birds were really the thing that, that I wanted to, to, to immerse myself in uh, as I grew up. The marsh area on the right, um, follow on, on from that first sighting I had with the school bird club in, in the 1980s. Um, we discovered a pair at Holcomb in 1982. And um, these were the first ones, or, or, the, or the second pair to be nesting on this coast in modern times. And, they're a species that had been hunted to extinction in Victorian times in, in East Anglia. So this was real big news and we had to do all we could um, everywhere where they, they occurred to protect them from, from unscrupulous hunting and egg collectors, things like that. So this was big news at Holcomb in the 80s. And, and again, I was lucky to be part of watching these first birds that, that returned. And now we have as many as probably 11 or 12 pairs nesting on Holcomb alone, and they, they really, that is really a, a conservation success story. So the other birds on the picture are it's a tiny little gold crest hiding under the oak leaves. There are migrant species that come across um, at this time of the year, actually, uh, from the continent, often in fantastic numbers uh, if, if the wind is blowing from the east, that sort of gives them a tail wind to cross the North Sea. And again, this was one of the things that really captivated me as a youngster. To, to see these tiny little birds, you know, you know um, and to think they'd come all the way across from Europe, and here they were in, in the woods at Holcomb. So my next stage from, from being captivated and, and spending all my spare time bird watching was to actually try and dip my feet into conservation work for real, which as I said was not easy, um, probably still isn't easy now, but in them days it seemed um, even harder. Um, when I was at school, uh, there was little impetus from careers people to, to have any, even any suggestions about how you should try and get into conservation. Um, so it was a case for me of, of helping out with the wardens along the coast as, as a volunteer. And that involved usually looking after the bird at the bottom, which is a little tern. That's the smallest nesting seabird, and again, a migrant species. They, they come here in the springtime from, from the African coast to nest on our beaches. And uh, they've always been very vulnerable through lots of reasons, predation, washing out by high tides, um, and, and most importantly in the past, from persecution and egg collectors. So this is why they always had to be guarded in the colonies where they nested. And this was part of my duties as a volunteer. And then finally that worked out to be, I was offered a post as a, uh, a summer warden by Natural England or English Nature as they were then. So I gave up my job, I thought nothing ventured, nothing gained. I gave up a job as a printer, which I despised by that time in the early 2000s as a seasonal warden. Um, and I thought, well, I'll worry about what I do in the winter when the winter get here. So. Um, and I ended up making will offences, so that's how that all came about. But um, the, the the great thing was I I had a job in conservation for six months, sitting on a beach looking after little terns and looking after marsh harriers and lapwings on the grazing marshes, and this this was the life I'd always wanted. And uh, again, just through sheer passion, uh, determination, um, and a will to succeed, I. I, kept, I stuck at that and I finally got offered a, a full-time job as a warden um, on, on Holcomb Estate, which is what, where I still am and still enjoying it just as much as I did when I first wanted to do the job. So that's, that's my history and the, as you can see, the, the times are changing and they changed drastically for me. 
and they changed finally to the direction I wanted them to be in. So what, what is special about this area we live in, um, North Norfolk? Holcombe's just a small part of it. So when many people think about coming to Norfolk and, and what epitomises Norfolk, they all talk about how marvellous Norfolk is, the skies, the wildlife. But when it boils down to it, most people are usually only talking about this very small section of coast from sort of Salt House through to Holm, 25 miles. But for most people, that is their Norfolk. If you talk about Litchim or Hell Houghton, nobody's interested because that's, that's, that's the agricultural hinterland, the desert where there is no wildlife. So they all want to be here. So um, it's a very special place and it's the place that's got lots and lots of history that revolves all around conservation. The, the, do, the two subjects, the, or the, the place and the subject are deeply entwined and as, as you'll see, which I'll try and explain. So the, the whole coast, some people call it the salt marsh coast, the, the, the main sort of habitat feature that gives North Norfolk its great character is the salt marshes. So from, from uh, sort of Cly and Salt House through, apart from a few gaps where reclamations have happened, there's a continuous stretch of salt marsh through to Titchwell, Thornham and Holm. One of the finest stretches in all of Western Europe it's a land influenced by, obviously, shaped by the sea, washed over them by the sea twice a day with the tides. Um, and any, anything and everything that lives there has to be, obviously, completely well adapted to immersion from salt water. So this is what gives the, the area its real character. The harbours, the, the fishing industry, everything revolves around the salt marshes. Uh, and this picture here is a, is a great one that's taken from the air, obviously, looking out to the west over uh, uh, Burnham Overy and towards Skolt Head and in the distance. But that also shows you clearly the, the sea bank and how the land was claimed back from the, from the sea from the sort of 1700s onwards. And again, maybe we'll, we'll end up full circle and, and end up losing some of these spots. But again, we'll talk about that as we go on. So, the fact is, these marshes, um, for the most, up, and up until relatively recent times, were they're uninhabitable, uh, they're shaped by the weather, the tide. Um, they're virtually the only wilderness we really have in, in North Norfolk, or certainly in Norfolk, really, even these days. Um, you take an area like Skolt Head, um, Nature Reserve, and Wells through to Sifki. There's, there's very few places left where the influence of people is, isn't pronounced like, not so pronounced as it is here. And, and this sense of isolation and wildness is why vast numbers of birds make their way to North Norfolk and spend the winter here. A lot of the birds, the, the wildfowl, the ducks, the geese, the wading birds, they all come from um, the Arctic where they nest and they, they move south for a, a, a milder climate. Um, somewhere where there's plentiful food, food. and uh, the marshes uh, of our coast is obviously the ideal place. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds flock here. Um, this picture was actually taken on the wash at Snettisham and the great um, swirling mass of birds you can see sort of on the horizon there, they're a bird called the knot uh, and they're a pl rather plump, plain wading bird. In isolation, they're not very exciting, but when you see these massive flocks of them wheeling around, you, you're seeing one of the best spectacles that you can see anywhere in the world. You know, people talk about the wildebeest migration and, you know, these, these vast, magnificent spectacles from, from the wild. But if you've never been to Snetisham and seen these clouds and wading birds, I fully recommend it on a tide because you will be spellbound by, by the spectacle. And only this week, the numbers have reached an all-time record, 140,000 knot are currently feeding around the, the wash at Snatchin. A, a phenomenal number of birds. So, excuse me while I just take a drink. Not whiskey, but like the rock and roll style. So, Conservation, um, the conservation in North Norfolk really started off thanks to the men with a gun. 
So what we have to remember is in, in the 1800s when the fledgling conservation movement really took off, things were vastly different in North Norfolk to they are today. Everyone was working class. Everyone worked from the land, the sea, or the bit between the land and the sea, and times were hard. Um, so people had to do anything they could to exist, and this involved poaching, hunting, shooting, um, trapping. And obviously with these vast numbers of birds that were, were wintering on our coastline, this was the place to be um, for people in this area to, to, to get a subsistence living. And obviously there was also things like um, Sanford to be picked, cockles, uh, you know, things like that. So the marshes were a place for people to, uh, to subsidize their living. So with the advent of the railways in the 1800s, obviously more people started to come to the area and a lot of wealthy people started to come. And that, they, they soon got the idea that there was good shooting to be had, good hunting to be had. So not only were local people earning a living or helping to, to survive thanks to hunting their own food, they started to take out wealthy hunters out across the marshes. These people were commonly known as the gentlemen gunners. So they would pay handsomely to a local to be escorted to the East Hills or the marshes at Stifke or Warham to, um, to shoot ducks and geese. And also at the time, it was very fashionable, um, particularly amongst wealthy um, vicars, doctors, clergymen, uh, all, all manner of people who had a little bit of money and, and a bit of time, and they became interested in the science of ornithology. And uh, the, the fashion became shooting birds to preserve by stuffing them, and the rarer the bird, the more valued it became, and the bigger the collection you had, well, the, the more um, reputable and famous you became. And the fact that North Norfolk um, still, which today still runs, rings true, we are situated on, on, the, on the coast, situated in Europe. So for all these mig migrating birds, the first place they hit when they leave um, the continent and they cross the North Sea is the, the North Norfolk coast. So consequently, we get lots of unusual birds turn up that migrate the wrong way on the continent or from a far off field of Asia, Siberia even. Um, so this was a happy hunting ground for the, for the gentlemen gunners who wanted to uh, shoot and preserve these rare specimens. So as I said, the rarer the species, the more lucrative it became, more valuable it became. Now, this slide here shows three very unusual birds. The species in the middle is called the Palace of Sandgrouse. Now these are a, a bird that's a little bit like a, a game bird, a little bit like a pigeon, but they live in the deserts of uh, uh, sort of south, southern, sort of the Mongolia, Kazakhstan, you know, th these kind of far off eastern places. Um, and for some reason in the 1800s, there, there were several years in succession when something seriously went wrong with their migration and, and vast numbers ended up in, in Britain. And we here in, the, in North Norfolk were at the hub of this place where they all came. So you can well imagine how all these happy go lucky shooters and the people who were trying to find the birds, the locals were often employed to go out and find these birds and then take the shooters to him. A bit like trophy hunting in, in, the, in the African continent now. So you can imagine how they all felt when they started to see these birds that had never been seen before arriving en masse. And uh, I think I'm right in saying there was over 180 shot in North Norfolk alone. So nearly everyone that appeared ended up shot. And uh, that even got to the stage where they were suspected of nesting, but the, the, the birds had their eggs um, taken and blown to be collected but the, the eggs were ruined in the process so whether they ever nested here or not we, we're never really quite sure it couldn't be proven so the, the bird that looks a bit like a, a robin with a union jack jacket on is called a blue throat so these these are birds that are songbirds from scandinavia and across into russia and beyond and they they nest out in the taiga forests and the tundra in willow thickets 
And again, with an east wind, they might sometimes migrate the wrong way and end up on the North Norfolk coast. We know there was a lot, lot more of them in the 1800s, and uh, the, this was the key species that the hunters used to be out and about for. And any morning with, with wind and rain and a mist and a northeast wind became known as the blue throat morning because this was the time, this was the weather and the conditions where these birds appeared. So we know in the 1880s, in one particular autumn at Cly, over 80 were shot. A phenomenal, if any of you are interested in birds, you'll know now that if we see two in a year, we're, we're doing quite well. And the little green and yellow bird right on the, on the far side there is, is another marvel of nature, really. That's called a palace's warbler. So that's a tiny bird, the, the size of a goldcrest, the size of our smallest bird. So that bird nests, this bird nests in the taiga forests of, of Eastern Asia, Siberia. And for some reason, every year in October, if the wind's blowing from the east, they appear here in Norfolk. So you're talking of a bird that is minute and has migrate, migrated all the way across Asia and Europe and ended up here. Remarkable. So the, the first one to be seen in Britain was a bird that was shot at Cly by a gentleman gunner. He, he, he was beside the marsh at Cly and uh, very often these, these gunners would have a, a dog with them to sniff out or sh flush out, should we say, birds from the, the swader bushes on the salt marshes. And the, the, the first British record, so it was quite a nice story, because the chap who shot it, he was sitting, sitting down on near the east bank at Cly, and his, his dog went up to a bush and pricked his ears up and looked into the bush. And uh, the old boy whose dog it was uh, decided he should investigate, and he saw this bird he was unfamiliar with, shot it, and it turned out to be a palace's warbler, the first for Britain. So uh, quite how much was left after it had been shot uh, is, is another story. So the, the key thing about showing you these pictures of these rare birds is because at the time there was, there was no conservation organisations. All this was going on in the name of science. Nobody saw any ill harm in, in all these birds that being shot and protected, except a, a small minority of people who suddenly started to say to themselves, is this right? Should all these birds be getting shot? And one of, one of the um, influences of, of, these, of this happening was an organization formed called the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society, one of the, one of the oldest sort of science-based conservation um, recording organizations in the country, still going today, um, still records the birds of the county, and is still, got its foot in the camp of science in all aspects of natural history. So these are the people who, who a few people formed this organisation and they decided that enough was enough, something has to be done to try and slow down or even stop all this kind of thing going on. So, so what I'm trying to get at is through the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalists we then went on to bird protection societies, which I'll get on to in a little while. And then, obviously, nature reserves like Blakeney Point, Skull Head, the, the, the earliest nature reserves. And, and through those nature reserves being created, we saved bits of this coast. And if you look at the Salt Marsh Coast, that 25 mile stretch of the coast that we all love for what it is, they're all nature reserves, they're all protected areas. So I, I maintain to this day that these people in the past, in the 1800s, these eccentrics, who, who thought about saving a few birds from Asia, these were the people who shaped the preservation of our coast as we know it today. So not only were the, the birds that visited um, Norfolk shot and uh, protected, but also the birds that nested here were persecuted in, in just as drastic a way. So the, the bird here we know as the Avocet, the white bird with the upturned black bill, they're a common sight now all along this coast. But um, believe it or not, in 1820, they were, they were hunted to extinction. The last place they nested was Salt House, and the last ones were shot because the, the old birds were known as for good eating, and the, the eggs were known to make very good pancakes and puddings. So this caused about the, the complete disappearance of the, the Abbaset, and they never returned to Norfolk until 1977. So that shows you, and now, they are everywhere along the coast. So again, a real conservation success story.
The bird at the top uh, right there is the oyster catcher. So we all know what an oyster catcher is. Um, everyone's familiar with oyster catchers, but as the 1800s were coming to close, there were very few left along the North Norfolk coast. They, again, they were hunted, their eggs were collected, and there were none successful, and maybe only two nests along the hull of somewhere like Blakeney Point or Cly. So again, this is another reason why conservation started in, in North Norfolk. Um, the earliest conservation organisation was, was based around braid and water at Yarmouth, to, to look after these nests and birds. And not long after the, the Braden example, we had one start um, in the late 1800s at um, Warham and Stifke. Um, that was an instigation from uh, a landowner at Stifke. And with the cooperation with Holcomb Estate, they, they let um, this Wild Bird Protection Society, as it was known as, um, have, a, have a, a seasoned watcher, they called him, he was a gamekeeper, and he was very much the equivalent of what I do today. He was a warden on, on the what we call Stifty Binks, and he was employed to look after the nest and terns, the oyster catchers, and the ring plovers. These birds, as I say, they, they were on the verge of becoming extinct, and within probably about a 20-year period of, of, the, of a, a warden being employed, the whole situation turned on a sixpence, and the population started to increase again. So again, that is a, a, big, a big thanks to all those pioneering conservationists while we have the coast we have today. So the Wild Bird Protection Society at Wales and Warren was highly successful and a, and a follow up from that was um, in the early, I think it was 1912, Blakeney Point was actually made an official nature reserve, a protected area. So the point was, um, from its, from its beginnings at Wayborn to the, the tip of the point, about eight miles of a shingle spit backed by sand dunes and salt marshes and Blakeney Harbour. This was a tremendous place that was rapidly gaining knowledge in the scientific circles of the 1800s. Uh, university students from Cambridge would come to botanise and to study the birds. So this made... The, and from this great font of knowledge that came from these people who came to visit, uh, this was the impetus for the first fully fledged nature reserve on this coast. And again, Blakeney Point suffered um, dramatically from persecution. This is Skullhead Island, which followed the example of um, Blakeney Point and was the next place on this coast to be made a nature reserve. Very similar to um, Blakeney Point, with the exception of uh, completely an island at, at uh, high tide. Um, and and the, the similarities between Skull Head and Blakeney Point are, are very pronounced. The, the bird life is very similar. The seabirds that nest there, the shorebirds, and the, the dune and the shingle flora. So these became ideal bed partners along this coast to be two nature reserves that were, were bookending a big section of the North Norfolk coast. So the key species on both these sites are, are terns. Terns, to the uninitiated, uh, they, they could potentially look a bit like seagulls, but they are, are far more elegant and um, charismatic than gulls. Um, they're streamlined, um, long tails, pointed wings, long pointed beaks, and um, they're very noisy. They've got characteristic behaviors that set them apart and they migrate, all the species migrate to, to Africa and then come back in the spring. So this one is called the sandwich tern. And uh, here in North Norfolk, we have one of the biggest colonies in the country. They're either at Skull Head or Blakeney Point, or sometimes both places host colonies. And we may have as many as five to 6,000 pairs, uh, you know, through, going back through history at, at the peak, when nesting on this coast. Um, and for species that, first nested in the late 1800s on the point at Blakeney. This was this has again been a real conservation story when you think about the efforts these people went to in the 1800s to, to safeguard these sites. Again, they were persecuted um, wholesale for their eggs by locals and then even 
in, in the two wars, when soldiers were stationed on the coast, they supplemented their rations with, with eggs from, from nest and terns. Thankfully, those days are in the past. So the next place um, integral to the, the whole uh, ambience of conservation and the sort of almost a natural history touristic element of this coast was Cly. So Cly marshes uh, in the east, they, they were um, always a haven for wild fowlers. Um, there was a, a combination of fresh and brackish marshes, salt marshes, and there was always large numbers of ducks and uh, it became a place that um, was heavily shot. So this seemed the ideal place for another nature reserve for things to be preserved. And that happened in the 1920s. And again, it wasn't long before, uh, with, the, with the demise of, of shooting, that birds started to, to nest and it became a, a real mecca for bird watchers. So the bird behind me here is a bittern, which is a very charismatic and rare member of the heron family. And they, they live their whole lives in reed beds. As you can see, they're very camouflaged. They blend into the, the reeds, especially in the winter time when the, the leaves are all, uh, the reeds are all brown. And they have this characteristic pose of standing alert to blend into the reed beds. So bitterns um, have always been a, a, a rare and an unusual species. And it was a real coup uh, for, for Cly when not long after becoming a nature reserve that they started to nest there. So the Cly story grew and grew from, from those early beginnings. And uh, in the 1960s, many people used to walk along the, the bank, the footpath there, which is called the East Bank. And there's a, there's a marsh right at the bottom towards the sea bank there called Arnold's Marsh. And this became renowned as a site for attracting uh, lots of bird watchers who could sit and watch what came along. Lots of rare and unusual wading birds and ducks and things were seen. And the reputation uh, grew and grew, and it became so famous in the British Isles that everybody who wanted to watch birds would always come to Cly. Um, it became known as the mecca of uh, bird watchers in, in the UK. And that reputation has never really gone away. So um, the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, uh, obviously proudly uh, owners of the site, managers of the site, and the uh, are still a fantastic place with an even better infrastructure now with hides and boardwalks and all the rest of it. So this brings us a little bit back up to date. In the 1960s, um, most people who watched birds were still probably, I'd go as far as to say, the, the gentry, the wealthy, those who had either disposable income so they could get here or lots of time which they could indulge in, in the, these pursuits. Obviously optical equipment again was, was hard to come by for the working man in these parts but um, the wealthy could afford binoculars. Um, but as, as time progressed through the 1970s obviously these kind of things um, got a lot more easy to come by and the, the, the pursuit of bird watching grew and grew and grew. And uh, the habit of twitching, as, as you're all familiar with the term twitcher, but the twitching scene really started in the 60s and 70s. So some of you may not realise where the term twitcher comes from, but um, there was a, a particular bird watcher from from the south, and he used to he used to travel everywhere on a motorbike, and he would hear what was about in, around the British Isles and he was obsessed with trying to see all these different rare species. So he'd traveled from place to place on his motorbike. And when he got there and got off, he'd always light up a, a, a roll up fag and he'd be cold to the bone from being on this motorbike and he would physically be twitching. So the, the expression, here comes Howard, he's twitching again. So this is where the term twitcher comes from. So, um, Twitch, the twitching scene really took off in Norfolk again. The, the phenomenon of all these rare birds coming off the back of an easterly wind in migration seasons, the same rare birds that these hunters and shooters used to be actively trying to shoot and preserve in the 1800s, the scene is, is exactly the same today, except people are obviously looking to see them with binoculars and telescopes and take photographs of them. And uh, 
the whole scene has changed from word of mouth, even telegrams in the 60s, telephone information services came along in the, in the late 80s and 90s, and of course we've got the internet and mobile phones and, and uh, everything that we have today. So the two birds that I've depicted there are, are, are both very unusual. The one at the top with the black stripe through the eye and the white stripe above its eye is called the red-breasted nuthatch. Now this bird's about the size of a blue tit, and uh, believe it or not, it lives its life in the, uh, the forests of Canada and North America, and usually it migrates into the southern states of America. But for some reason in 1990, one of these appeared in the pine woods at Holcomb. Never been seen before in the UK and never been seen since. But one appeared in one October, and that spent the whole of the, whole of the winter in, in Holcomb pine woods. And as you can imagine, the amount of people that came to see it was phenomenal. They reckon in the first weekend of its uh, being at Holcomb, there was 2,000 people come to see it. And this, so this was not that, not that long after uh, the 60s in some respects from when that old boy was on his motorbike riding about with his fags and twitching like Billy O when he arrived at sites. But everything was more organised and people were coming from as far away as the Scilly Isles in Scotland um, overnight to try and see this bird in the pine woods at Holcomb. Which brings us to this rather strange looking bird in the bottom with its tail cocked up. So this is current right bang up to date. This is called the Rufus Bush Chat and uh, or the Rufus Bush Robin. That's a bird bigger than a robin, our robin, um, a lot plainer, but with this fancy orangey chestnut orange tail that's cocked up in the air when it moves. So they inhabit um, the, the steppes and arid country of, of, of Central Asia throughout Southeast Europe and across to Spain. Uh, there's probably only been about eight records in the UK, never been seen in Norfolk, and the last one seen in the UK was probably about 40 years ago. So when one, turn, when one turned up at Stifke only uh, three or four days ago, as some of you may be aware, the North Norfolk ground to a halt. <laughs> they reckon there was 900 people over Saturday and Sunday came to Stifke to see this bird. So, and I think that was that was seen yesterday, but not today. So, this is this is the length. That, and uh, the interesting thing about that, a great story involved this. That was in a field at Stifke, uh, and when the tide uh, started to drop, that flew out in the middle of a salt marsh and went into a swader bush. And these obsessive bird watchers couldn't wait for the tide to go out. And uh, being uh, blow-ins from far away, not from these parts, they didn't realise that the salt marsh actually has creeks and nooks and crannies under that big sea of water. So they all went out across the, the, the uh, salt marsh at high tide and several of them actually disappeared in creeks, which is a <laughs> great story. So, um, so since, since Cly and places like Blakeney Point and, and Skull Head became nature reserves, so as the 20th century progressed, more and more places along this coast start to be swallowed up in this uh, network of, of conservation and nature reserves. Uh, and that process is still ongoing. Uh, and that's a dream of some conservationists along this coast now to, to think that all the land on the north side of the A149 might be returned to nature. That's the sort of a pipe dream that a lot of conservationists have got. Quite whether that will happen or not is, is, is still early days yet. But we can say that in places that is happening. So the picture at the top is what we call the North Point at Wells, and that's probably one of the, the most recent uh, stabs at conservation along this coast. Fantastic area, former fields that have been uh, flooded uh, on a, by a tenant farmer of, of Holcomb, the Harrisons, and uh, that's proved to be an amazing spot. So it just goes to show if you can provide water on freshwater uh, fields that were often quite dry or arable fields, the, the birds, the wildlife soon soon discovers it and makes it its home. So a lot of conservation initiatives have gone into the, the grazing marshes along this coast. For these birds here, these are lap wings with the fancy crest and a red shank with the red legs with its beak wide open. And, and these are birds that, that nest on the salt marshes and the, in the case of the red shank and the, the lap wing on the grazing marshes. And because 
agricultural changed so much in the 20th century, a lot of these birds like the lapwing lost their homes. Uh, and this coastline has become a, a real lifeline in the county for these birds. And again, that's one of these things where the organisations, uh, the various conservation organisations do their utmost to make the habitat right for these birds to exist. So the, 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 the times are a change and we, again, we go back to my title at the start and the times certainly are changing all around us in all walks of life. We're always hearing about climate change. We're hearing from some parts, President Trump and people like that. Is it happening? Is there such a thing as climate change? Do we believe it? Well, you know, whether you believe it or whether you don't, you only have to look at what's happening in the natural world around our home. And these birds here are all species that used to live in warmer places. Um, the, the bird on the, on the, the right actually has a, a deeper history with the UK. It's the spoonbill, hence named because of its spoon-shaped beak. They were hunted to extinction as far back as the, as the 1500s here in the UK, but they then returned bit by bit, uh, year by year, gradually, and they finally started to nest in 2010 at Holcombe. And from six nests in 2010, we've now gone to 28 nests in pairs a real conservation success story. The, the birds are now spreading out and nesting in other places. So the warmer, the warmer climate is definitely helping those. But the other two species definitely are indicators of true climate change. The top species is called the Cataligra. So if any of you have been to Africa and on safari, you've probably seen these birds sitting on the backs of hippos and uh, feeding around elephants on the plains. Um, so throughout sort of the, the 1800s onwards and the 20th century, this, this species started to move. They, they colonized the New World, even from Africa, flying across the Atlantic, and they're now a common species in much of South America and even the States. And they started to march through Southern and Central Europe and ended up in France, and then finally ended up in the UK. And um, th this year we had a nest at Holcomb for the first time. Uh, yeah, and these species wouldn't be able to exist if it weren't for the, the warmer winters we have and, and the, the more, even the milder springs we have where, where there's available food for them to eat. And the bird at the bottom is called the great white egret. And again, this was a species that was hunted to virtual uh, demise in Europe. Only a few hung on, but through dedicated efforts by conservationists, uh, they survived and then they start to reclaim their former haunts across Western Europe, Southern Europe, and then again through climate change, they've been able to adapt and move to the UK and, and live here all year round. So times are changing. And again, the exotic. So even more exotic is the hoopoo. We've not got a nest in here yet, but again, I threw this one in because only two weeks ago we had one along the road at Whiten. But that, again, there are species that we think of as, as occurring in southern Europe, in warmer places, in Africa. Um, and uh, maybe this could be the future. Could we be seeing birds like hoopoos and beaters? The, the gull at the bottom is called a Mediterranean gull. And again, as its name suggests, used to live around the Mediterranean, common around the Black Sea. But up until the 90s, they were very, very rare in the UK. But now, they're very much established. They're nesting in big numbers in Kent and, all, and uh, here in Norfolk, they, they nest at Snettisham and Titchwell and places like that. And the black winged still is this very fancy, uh, exotic looking wading bird with long red legs, hence its name, the stilt, and the long black beak. And uh, last year, we were lucky enough to ha ha attract a nesting pair um, on the nature reserve at Holcomb. And, a, and, a similar, and similar things happen all around the country. They're now one of these species that are coming every spring in very small numbers. And we're probably right at the cusp of, of a colonization of the whole country if, if we continue to get these warm uh, and drawn out springs and summers. And it's not just birds. Uh, you, you know, the, the amount of, of, of invertebrate life that we are now seeing just in this local area at Holcomb and Wells, that, that are all, that, you know, 10 years ago they weren't here. Uh, 
this is called a wasp spider. Um, that, that was first seen in the, in the UK um, probably 50, 60 years ago. Um, not seen in Norfolk probably till 10 years ago. And now they're more and more are seen each year. A real fantastic looking spider that you'll see in the grasslands along the coast. The wasp at the top is called a bee wolf. Um, that's a very, uh, so that digs a hole in the sand, that catches a honeybee, and that flies off with the honeybee, stings the bee, kills the bee, and, and lay, the, the, the eggs are lying, of, of the bee, are lay, uh, of the wasp, sorry, are, are laid in, the, in this tiny little burrow in the sand with, with the bee. And the dragonfly is called a small red-eyed damselfly. Uh, again, a species that wasn't even in Britain until the early 2000s. And now the, the dikes at Holcombe are full of these in July. And these are just three examples of, of, of some invertebrates that are now quite well established in this area. And I could talk all night about different bugs and beetles that are now here that weren't. So this is a true indication that these insects are, are travelling across the North Sea and, and colonising our area here. So there's some good good changes and there's some not so good. So the, the, the agricultural hinterland of North Norfolk is no longer the place it once was. Efforts are being made, but of all the places where species have been lost, it's most pronounced in the, in the farmland through a combination of pesticides, insecticides, hedges being massacred at the wrong time of the year, with, so there's no food, and all these common sites like flocks of house sparrows and tree sparrows you just don't see these things in the countryside anymore yellow hammers are declining turtle doves are, are virtually gone from the area so this is a huge cause of concern for many naturalists and environmentalists in this area but then some things again are increasing so otters got hunted to extinction and they suffered heavily uh, with pollution of rivers and waterways but through a reintroduction scheme um, in, in the 90s they are now well established again on all the river systems in the area here and on, and on the salt marshes and grazing marshes red kites a common bird now relatively in this area but hunted to extinction uh, in the 1800s ravens they they probably never have nested in in this area but even ravens now are starting to appear here and this again is through an enlightened enlightened attitude from landowners and gamekeepers these sort of things through through the antiquated views and the the, the way the shooting industry went in these bigger states they would never have stood a chance but but thankfully the mindset of all these different people have changed and with conservation these things are now thriving again the future, so what, ha what will the future bring? So this is a white-tailed eagle, fantastic, amazing raptor with, with an eight-foot wingspan. Lives on carrion, lives on fish. Will it appear here in Norfolk? They're nesting in Holland now. Uh, um, they've spread across the continent, so we see more every year occurring on, on, on this, in this area. Only last week there was a new one turned up just at Cookie Lodge beside uh, Whiten. So is this a bird that we will see in the future here in Norfolk? So times are changing. So one of the biggest changes, of course, the drivers of change are people. We live in this fantastic area and everyone now wants to come here. Every, everything about Norfolk is promoted. Every London supplement you pick up has got come to North Norfolk in. Can we, as an area, continue to um, preserve all this wildlife, all these fantastic places. My personal thought is we are now sitting at the cusp of a, of a big decision-making process. Are the decisions of the future more, are they gonna be more poignant and long lasting and more far reaching than those conservationists from the 1800s? At the time, there was very little life left in the countryside through persecution in the 1800s. So a very small group of eccentrics turned around in probably 10 or 20 years. Can we do the same? Can our coast withstand the constant pressure of, of dogs, 
running all year round along our beaches and disturbing wildlife. Birds like ring plovers and oyster catchers are now probably at their lowest ebb since they returned thanks to those initiatives from those conservationists. So one very sobering fact is the oyster catcher uh, out of 20 or 30 pairs nesting on the beaches between Wells and Burnham Overy produced not a single fledged youngster this year nor last year. And this is purely because of the amount of people, disturbance, uh, constant disturbance from dogs and sometimes this leads to predation. We, we are at the cusp of, of uh, taking away the egg of the golden goose if we're not careful. These are, these are things we all need to start thinking about, not just the birds for wildlife. The birds are indicators, but you look at the, the amount of rubbish that's been left in the landscape. Lockdown was an amazing period for us who were fortunate enough to be left here and been able to still uh, enjoy the coast with, with nobody uh, to, to, to see. But obviously that, the implications were enormous in the fact that the economy took a huge hit. So we now realise along this coast we need we need tourism uh, to make everybody, uh, make the whole place tick. Everybody's employed in one form or another w through the tourist industry. But can we withstand the constant promotion all around with the internet and uh, you know everything that's going on? We're seeing wild campers and fires this year like we've never seen before. Again, is this is this? Uh, is this a result of lockdown and people desperate to get away from the city, the inner cities and experience the wild countryside that we all love and enjoy here? Quite telling that all the people who came to wild camp and set fire to the woods at Holcombe and the sand dunes were all people from away. Two hours now from London, easy distance on a Friday night. How can we stop or how can we preach to these people that if you come to these places to enjoy it, as they all do, how can we stop them all from, from ruining it to the degree that we're on the cusp of it being ruined? And the other thing is, of course, the salt marshes from Wells through Astifki, our last great wilderness. What do we all think about? How do we go about preserving it as a wilderness? It's a part of a national nature reserve. It's still officially private land, but the status quo has been that people go out there, they enjoy it, if you want to enjoy it. Should we be actively promoting this place? Should we pr be promoting exploration by coastal companies? Foraging, everybody, in, in the turn of the 1800s and 1900s, when times were hard, people obviously had to get their subsistence, the, 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 the livelihoods from these places. Things are different now, but should we be inviting gangs of sand for pickers from from the fens to come here and it's a national nature reserve a triple si that you couldn't get a more protected area than this but again we're sitting on the cusp of things changing to the degree everybody wants to explore it because they come here but what is the ideal what are we all looking for here a paradise that that people can exploit or a paradise to preserve or somewhere in between and of course, the, the next series of changes is the ravages of the sea. Sea level rises. What, what will the future bring? Well, we know that the predictions from the scientists is a massive increase in the height of uh, the sea level. And where will this leave us? Will sites like this, where dunes are knocked to smithereens and, and uh, the, 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 the coastline enveloped by seawater, will that become ever more... Um, an ever more increasing phenomenon and what changes will we have to make? Will we have to forget, forgo some of the areas on the grazing marshes? Will we have to actively protect, protect places like Wells and Burnham Uvey far more than we are at the moment? Or will we live with it and will we see a different colonisation of, of birds and wildlife as a result? Whether we like it or not, these are changes and talks that we have to be having here today for what the impacts are for tomorrow. But my final, my final concern, and uh, you, this is my um, little uh, montage of country characters that I grew up with in Holton Park. So 
I always think that the people you mix with when you're young are, are those that shape your vision and your your soul and your your, your whole go on a, your whole person really your sense of humor that all comes from the people you mix with at a young age and I was exceptionally lucky to be brought up on Holcomb Park which had this amazing bunch of rural characters none of them had two shillings to love to rub together but they all loved what they did to a degree and the, the great um, thing that I think will be missing from anyone and everyone who's going to be brought up in this coast from here on in is they're going to be missing out on a whole wealth of people with characters there's 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 very few characters left in the countryside anymore you can't find these people unless you look really hard when I was young they were everywhere probably the same as many of the people here in there today they all had great stories they lived from the land and even today the people who still work from the land because they're distant they work in tractors all the time or they they haven't got that deep connection with the landscape and and the wildlife that all these people had and to me and and also the way they talk I'm watered down tonight you can probably understand me and I'm and that's a hard job for me to run on like this in, in a language that, that is not on a par with how these people used to speak but the language North Norfolk the broad Norfolk language is dying out fast and uh, again I think it's a terrible sad thing you know people look upon these as illiterates who, who, who didn't understand plain English but they understood the countryside and they conversed with it and uh, they were a lot cleverer than what a lot of people would give them credit for but these are the people who shape this landscape we live in and these are the people that we're going to lose in the very very near future. Thank you. Thank you.